Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today, and thanks for your patience with technology. Um, we're here to talk about uh, indigenous, attracting the Indigenous workforce in the mining industry. So, as we all know, the mining industry is experiencing a shortage of skilled workers, and the rapidly growing Indigenous youth population represents an untapped labor force that can help meet our demands. Attracting and retaining more Indigenous people in the mining industry really requires a combination of solutions, combining innovative ways to reflect cultural norms of various Indigenous communities, to enhancing opportunities for challenge, growth, and success in a variety of career paths. That's why we're fortunate to have this webinar today, um, hosted by the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Canadian Institute of Mining. The purpose of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee is to encourage diversity and inclusion with in, within the mining industry at large. We work to meet this goal through objectives that include encouraging increased diversity and inclusion within the broader CIM organization, providing guidance to CIM executives and the council on all things related to diversity and inclusion, and assisting CIM in linking messages around the business case and to the industry through publications, electronic communications, and conferences and outreach programs. I also want to take an opportunity to just do a quick introduction to the CIM Foundation, whose goal is to create and support a strong program of educational and charitable activities directed towards improving the contributions of the Canadian mineral industry to the progress and well being of Canada. The CIM Foundation provides students with funds to pursue studies in our industry and are not necessarily technical studies like geology or engineering, but anything that could support the development and advancement of the Canadian mineral industry. So to kick us off today, I think I should probably introduce myself. My name is Miriam Clark. I work as the VP Global Strategy and Business Growth for Okane Consultants. I'm also a member of the CIM Diet Group. Um, and I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I'm fortunate to join this webinar today from the traditional ter territories of the signatories of the Treaty 7, the Stoney Nakoda, comprising of the Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Wesley First Nations, the Tsutina First Nations, and the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Tsitsika, Pekani, and Ghana First Nations. Um, Calgary, where I'm joining from, is also homeland of the Métis Nation. I recognize that we're all joining from different um, lands today, so I wanted to acknowledge the past, present, and future generations who help us steward this land and honor and celebrate this place that I feel fortunate to call home. Like many in the industry, I feel like I have deeply benefited from generous and patient sharing of Indigenous knowledge. I believe that facilitating more opportunities for Indigenous people to join the mining industry will help our industry benefit and advance in a long term sustainable way. I'm very fortunate today to be joined by two incredible panelists, Freda Campbell, Community Relations Director of Shkina Resources, and Erin Ma, Senior Lead Indigenous Relations of Tech Resources. So Freda uh, empower, empower, embodies the future of mining industry through her dedication to powering the Indigenous workforce, innovation, Indigenous community engagement, and mentoring the next generation of Indigenous leaders. Freda has also worked in the mining industry for both proponents and Indigenous nations for over 25 years. She's a member of the Tall Town Nation Crow, Crow, Crow Clan and Dekama family and has lived in the Tall Town ter territory in communities directly affected by mining for over 15 years. Freda's commitment to the Taltan Nation and her vision for the mining industry makes her a trailblazer. She currently resides in the Des Lake, BC, and is a community relation um, Des Lake, BC. Erin uh, works to advance tech social performance objectives related to Indigenous communities. She's dedicated her professional career to Indigenous relations and social performance work with experience in mining, industry in the mining, energy, finance, and utility industries across Canada and in the United States. Her work has included the development of company-wide socioeconomic impact programs, reconciliation plans, and major project development. Erin holds a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Manitoba, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Gender Studies from the University of British Columbia, and a Certified and Management Consultant designation. And she's currently joining us from West Kelowna, where we have, uh, where she has assured us that she is safe. <laughs> um, and, and so thank you so much both for joining us today. And so I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of incredible questions coming from, but maybe I'll just start off um, with asking yourself, Freda, what are some of the benefits of enabling indigenous employment in the mining industry? 
Um, um, I when I went into the mining industry right out of college, and I immediately seen um, like the, the the how it could work. Like the um, this the schedule allows for um, local community members to still practice their culture, um, and did the local indigenous workforce will have a vested interest in your project um, and in the environmental stewardship of it. Um, and it will, uh, you know, it will work for the local community. You don't have to travel far. And in my experience, a local community won't leave in a skill shortage, which is of tremendous benefit to the mining industry. Thank you so much. Erin, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience. Do you think that there are some, what do you think the existing barriers are to encouraging Indigenous employment in the mining industry? Um, yeah, I would say, so first I'll preface this with, I'm relatively new to the mining industry. I just started with tech resources last year, so I still have lots to learn. Um, but, you know, there are a number of barriers that are both kind of individual, um, but then very systemic barriers as well. Um, so when we think about mining, we know that a lot of operations, for example, can be fairly remote. Um, so access is, is sometimes an issue. So there are barriers regarding things like, you know, driver's licenses is a very common one that we hear about. But getting a driver's license is also connected to bigger structural issues and the infrastructure deficit that happens with Indigenous communities and on reserves. So if you don't have a place where you can easily take your test, that's a barrier. And then it leads to further barriers and sort of that domino effect to accessing employment in places like the mining industry. Um, so I think when we think about barriers, we have to think about the individual person and what they're going through um, and how to help them as a person overcome barriers. But we also have to think about the structural barriers that exist both, and the ones that we can control as a company ones that um, you know, maybe we can build um, solutions towards, and then what are the bigger structural issues that we have to um, partner with government, for example, on to really think through and remove those barriers. And then of course, overarching all of this is just general awareness about mining and you know, an attraction to it, and what are the reasons to want to come to mining, um, and you know, culture. What is the culture of mining? What is the perceived culture of mining? What is the perceived culture of the individual company? What is the actual culture um, of that environment where that person might be working? So these are all things that can be both um, attractive pieces, uh, but there are tons of barriers along the way and we have to think through those very carefully. Thank you. Fred, I know when we were talking earlier, you shared some really excellent examples of some successful initiatives that you've been a part of or that you've seen in the mining industry to attract Indigenous employment. Maybe you could share with um, with our uh, attendees today some examples. Okay, um, one of the um, one of the things that Skina does that I, um, I'm so excited to be a part of is our mentorship program. So we um, try to attract. Um, tell time post-secondary students um, and and actually anybody who's graduated from um, who's graduated from high school but we bring in um, tell time members who uh, are in our post-secondary uh, education program and we bring them back to the territory um, we bring them home at, which is almost always very profound very profound experience for them. I know it's difficult for a lot of members who haven't come back for a long time to, to, to come back and come back to the community. So we, we make make that possible in a safe way. We go to culture camp, we bring them into the high school to talk to the students. Um, and we just create a safe place for them to come back, learn about our communities, learn about our culture, learn about our governance structures, learn about our economy. And those kinds of things. So um, it's been it's been incredibly successful. We really try and um, connect them with the Telcan youth who are in the territory. So our youth have somebody who um, has gone through the experience of going to school that they can talk to about different um, opportunities in mining, about what going to post secondary education looks like, and those things. So 
Yeah, we've been, uh, we, we started that program in 2020 and our mentees have come to the territory a number of times. They've made connections um, and they, they, they have appreciated that experience and they are now um, junior mining engineers, but we also look for people from the territory for the program too, but that's been, that's been very successful. And Fred, I know um, when we talked about it earlier, we talked about how important it was to, to sort of come to the communities, to be present in the communities, not, and I know we're, we all like to leverage, you know, the virtual tools or the electronic tools that we have at our disposal, but yeah, can you talk a little bit more about the, the importance of sort of coming to the community and in person? Absolutely. Um, I think it's, um, I have, you know, I've, um, it's always been my experience when people um, come to the community, it's a different level of understanding and it's a, you know, it's a different way of connecting and, um, you know, professionals in the mining industry always appreciate it, always go, oh, okay. <laughs> they get a better understanding and we we could really do um, a much better job of um, uh, 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 making sure that local people understand the kinds of opportunities there are in mining. Like, Something from the community may probably, you know, might not understand what an engineer does or, you know, sort of surveyor and, and those kinds of things, right? So really, I mean, it's so close, usually, I know in, in Teltan territory, our, our, our projects are close. And it's not hard to bring somebody in to the schools and, and talk about the what they do. And and we have quite a few Teltan members now who are in professional positions, such as myself, and we can go talk to them too. So um making that connection and making those opportunities real um you know in a live person who can talk about them and um and talking about the projects in person just in general is is is, is the best way to, to explain what you're doing how you're doing it <laughs> um so people have a better understanding yeah thank you so much so Erin you mentioned you're new to the mining industry, but you're not new to these challenges. You've had a fantastic career so far in many other industries. So is there something the mining industry should be learning from some of these other industries? Are there best practices we could be enabling ourselves with? Yeah, I think this is something I like to say to my colleagues all the time, and, and no matter what industry I'm in, and this is a habit that seems like just sort of an organizational culture, or maybe it's human nature, but we get trapped in our little bubbles, our own networks. And so I do think it's really important, and I encourage everyone on the call today to think about this, and that's connecting with people who are in other industries, because a lot of us, you know, are thinking about these things, thinking about barriers, thinking about opportunities, looking for innovative program ideas. Um, and so, yeah, looking outside your bubble is really important. You can draw a lot of inspiration from other areas. So um, maybe a couple examples. So, um, you know, I mentioned I used to work in oil and gas and utilities, so I'm familiar with some examples, but one really good one, one really good program that I've seen um, was uh, in the oil and gas industry. It was called the Close to Qualified Program. And so when we think about building that pathway to um, a particular career path, a particular job, there are a lot of people who might have, you know, a whole bunch of skills that are really applicable to that job, but they may be missing some pieces, some formal qualifications, some job experience, whatever it may be. And so designing sort of an interim programmatic step for people to step into who are close to qualified and just need a few more tickets, a few more hours, et cetera, and providing that space for them to develop it, um, that's a really, really good way to kind of create that next step to the pathway. So that's something that's sort of within an industry control environment that we can do, that we can invest in. I would say the other thing that I've seen um, is, you know, definitely looking at, um, we hear a lot about apprenticeship programs. There's been a really big focus on those opportunities, and we know we have an apprentice skill shortage, uh, and there's a need for more qualified tradespeople. So one thing I've seen from, for example, BC Hydro and other utility companies is a big focus on doing those apprentice programs. And of course, you have to work within things like, um, you know, your collective agreements and all of these pieces. So it can be pretty complex, but making sure that you pair those with opportunities for people who maybe don't want to work on the tools because um, there's always people out there who don't want to work outside. So thinking about the in-office programs that you can do that maybe aren't a formal apprentice program, 
but designing something that works for your organization, where maybe it's something like a rotational program. You bring someone in under you know, an entry level role and you get them to move around to different parts of the business and get exposure. And for someone really early in their career, that can be like invaluable. Going back to what Frida was alluding to as well with getting that exposure to really pick that path that you're excited about and that really fits with you. Um, if you don't have an opportunity to do that through other means, then that can be a really good program. And I think the mining industry can look for inspiration, maybe from some of those examples as well. Thanks. I may just build on that a little bit because the two of you have both mentioned sort of the importance of making sure people are aware of the opportunities. And, and Frida, you highlighted the importance of sort of mentorship. Do you have a specific example, um, either personal experience when you were a mentor or a mentee um, that, uh, you know, that, that you saw an opportunity to, to bring someone to the mining industry or highlight the opportunities that could be there for them? Um, yeah, um, absolutely. We have, um, the Telcan Nation has a has a very good uh, communication network. We have a newsletter. We have the ability to text members. We have the ability to um, to to message them, phone them. Like we just we're able to talk to each other. And I find that um, there's a number of um, of of Telcan professionals that are in the in the industry and the government. The Telcan Central Government has um, made videos. Um, the I think it, like. Videos are by far the, <laughs> the easiest way to reach out and, 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 and talk to people and, and explain things. So yeah, um, I find that the, um, the youth are, are quite knowledgeable about the, um, the opportunities and Facebook and social media has just made it so easy to reach out and talk to people. Um, and so, and we also try and create those opportunities as well. We have uh, job fairs, we have, um, you know, like the, we, the mining industry comes to the community and talks to people. Um, so it's getting easier. You know, when I started, it really wasn't like that. Um, it was very difficult to help people understand, but it's getting easier and we have tools now that are making it so much easier, um, easier to talk to people. And, and yeah, it's getting better. People are becoming more knowledgeable about it. You know, mining just isn't, you know, people back in the day, people just thought it was like, a, you know, like digging up dirt, a dirty place to work where, you know, you're underground. Um, but so I think there's a much better understanding. Um, but I do, yeah, usually community, like for me, I'm obviously very passionate about um, local communities benefiting from, from industry. And um, yeah, coming to community, I just, you know, can't say it enough how important it is to talk to people, and especially youth. We have youth that are, you know, so bright and so, you know, they're talking to our youth in particular. There's such a uh, an opportunity there to um, to engage with the uh, the youth in the high school who are just figuring out what they want to do. It's absolutely an incredible opportunity. So if, if you were talking to an Indigenous youth who is maybe exploring what their potential career options were, what kind of resources would be available to them to learn about the mining industry? Um, like having industry come to the community and, and be able to talk to people, for sure. You know, like um, being able to talk, to, to be face-to-face -face with people, having having people come to the to the school and talk to youth, but there's a lot out there as well. Like there's materials that have been developed by um, AME and there's there's curriculum that has been developed for for um, schools which I really I, I really want to be able to bring into the our D Slay school, right? But there's there's lots of um, lots of resources out there for um, to to engage the youth in 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 mining. We just, um, you do have to look for them a little bit, but yeah, there's been things developed for sure. Yeah. But I think that's, oh, sorry. <laughs> Please keep going. Yeah, don't let me stop. Um, I, re I don't think anything really beats those videos, like talking like real people, real people you can relate to, um, maybe you know, talking about their experience in mining, I think is really the best tool. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, Erin, how about yourself? What kind of resources do you think are available to either people interested in working in the mining industry or mining industry um, interested in reaching out? What kind of resources have you seen to be helpful? 
Yeah, I think um, I want to kind of echo and build on what what Frida was saying with, you know, nothing beats a real human <laughs> boots on the ground having conversations or, you know, because everyone's a lot more used to virtual like videos and social media are great. I think kind of, you know, some of the practice has been attending things like job fairs have been done by traditionally maybe an HR person or an industry or sorry, community relations person. And I think it's really important to make sure that those events and other forums are attended by, you know, people who do different kinds of work. So getting people who maybe drive heavy equipment, people who work in the mill, like all sorts of areas of the organization coming to those events as well and meeting and talking firsthand about their experience. And then you stay away from sort of that very, you know, not interesting dynamic of, you know, here's a, here's a job description, here's a pamphlet that you may or may not read. But instead, we can chat about anything and then maybe find a way to connect as human beings. And that's going to get you really interested in this work and excited. And it just makes it a little bit more real and breaks down that sort of, you know, barrier of that's something that someone else does that I don't know, you know, anything about. No one in my family does that. So, yeah, bringing it as close to home and making it as personal as possible is like the most powerful way to get through to people. And I recall when we were speaking earlier, one of the things you mentioned was about sort of looking at the culture of hiring and how even just, um, you know, approaching the culture of hiring from a different perspective could encourage more um, recruitment and retention. Is there anything you wanted to sort of build on that front? Yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done here. So when we think about, for example, the classic employment life cycle, it sort of starts at that point of, you know, uh, recruitment and that hiring process. So the first thing I think that needs to be done is to, you know, build that pathway into that step. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, investing in community, getting people interested, thinking outside of that first step and all that can be done to build that, uh, that pathway in for people to even submit a resume. So there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done there. And uh, of course, this involves things like, you know, posting in different uh, job boards, uh, making sure that your, um, your language when you're recruiting is inclusive. These are all big things and making sure that it's meeting people where they're at. So when you send out job descriptions, it can be through uh, LinkedIn and these kinds of places, indeed, uh, your, your website. Um, but it also has to involve some research as to, you know, what does this particular nation or community, how do they interact? How do they communicate with one another? Who are some people that we could talk to and say, hey, can you help us spread the word about these opportunities? It may involve, you know, physical posters in community offices and community forums. And then that boots on the ground, just sort of talking to people and generating interest that way. And then when you get into the actual, you know, recruitment and hiring process, you have to make sure that um, both the hiring manager and the HR uh, personnel have that cultural awareness. So, you know, cultural awareness training is a big part of this and making sure that people understand how to conduct interviews in a culturally appropriate way. And knowing that maybe Indigenous people have different, you know, uh, signals uh, may just look a little bit different than other people in interviews and you have to be able to account for that and make sure that you're not being biased against that. So things like, I don't know, maybe eye contact is different. Uh, you know, uh, Indigenous people often don't want to like talk themselves up. It's a very humble um, culture. And so making sure that you're, you know, aware that they might not want to like speak, you know, so fully to a lot of their experiences and, and it can be looked at as boasting. So how do you make it into like more of a conversational format as opposed to like a question and answer form might be a way to really get around that and draw people out into a conversation. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of some of the things you can do. But the other thing I would recommend is making sure that, you know, training around this is not a one and done. Um, and I think it's a practice. And if you aren't, say, an Indigenous person yourself, if you don't spend a lot of time in community, you do training, you might practice it for a while, uh, and then, you know, you can kind of lose it if you're not using it. And so making sure that you're constantly updating and staying connected to that skill set as an interviewer is really important as well. And is there anything you want to build on that? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think um, there are so many ways industry can support community um, in education and training. And I see one of the questions in the in the chat um, about trauma effect and um, those kinds of things. But um, understanding the community and the like the lack of capacity in the community. Um, often there's a you know a lack of frontline workers. Um, you know, like there's usually there's usually a lack of capacity. In in the community to deal with with some of the issues that they face. When I worked with Barrett, they hired, a, she was um, called a social development coordinator. And her job was to deal with the effects of um, the, the, the social impacts of working at a mine site. So she came to understand the local community and you know how they, you know, she was had a personal relationship with all the frontline workers and understood um, you know, where they needed support and really industry supporting a community who like, for example, reaching out for resources for training, you know, support letters saying, you know, they support this initiative, like those kinds of things. There's a tremendous opportunity there. Um, the social development coordinator was a, um, a, a registered therapist and she was able to admit people into treatment and she, she could do that from site. So she supported that from site for the local community. She was also able to continue um, any therapy that somebody from the community was going through. She could make sure that there was not a, you know, it, it would continue that work and then also in the community. So there's lots of ways to support that. And um, yeah, I've uh, in the community we but we've accessed um, when I worked for the Telton Central Government we've accessed funding for training programs. We went to industry and said, "What do you need? What kind of certifications do you need?" And we put together a package that suited the the local industry of forestry and mining, exploration operations, and those things. And um, if you can go to the uh, funding organization with letters from employers saying, "Yeah, we need these." Like you're you're more likely to get them. So working with the community, understanding where they're at, and supporting their own initiatives that they're trying to, you know, they're facing is it is tremendously helpful and a great opportunity for both organizations. Maybe too, I'll, I'll um, just going back to John's comment in the chat about sort of the trauma informed recruitment and retention. I have a couple other thoughts and, and things that I've seen start to work on this. And I think one, you have to look critically at the HR culture in your organization. If HR is looked at as working for the business and not for employees, and it doesn't isn't viewed as like a safe space that people can go to, or at least there's one safe person that people can go to, that's going to be a huge barrier because if people are struggling uh, and they need accommodations, for example, uh, and they don't feel like they can come to HR to talk about it, then they're going to leave. So you have to make sure that there's a doorway there for people to actually have these conversations in a safe way. So I think when we think about the classic skills of HR professionals, we actually have to start to layer in some of those skills like Frida's colleague about trauma-informed practice. Maybe someone with more of a social work or some similar type of background would be really good to come into an HR role. And so thinking critically about, you know, your HR professionals and do they have the skills to have these conversations? And then also thinking about that from a hiring manager perspective. So again, giving them the tools to be able to identify is someone having a bad day? Are they going through things? How do I have that conversation? And I don't know about anyone else on this call, but I feel like, especially since COVID, there's been kind of a little bit more of a blurring of the barriers between the personal and professional. I blurred it now where you can like literally see my home behind me, for example. And so I think we're starting to get a little bit more comfortable with, you know, if I see someone struggling, it's not their business. It's my team member. And I have to be able to try to have those conversations or find ways to support them. So thinking about all of those things in that environment around people who maybe have trauma, um, that's a that's a big step that we can take. Yeah, um, I remember when we were talking earlier, there was a term that you used that really stuck with me. It was you talked about, you know, creating a, a full em employment ecosystem and recognizing that it, yeah, it's it's not just a single point hiring or, a, or you know, a, like a once a year annual review, but it's about creating an ecosystem of, of inclusion 
and, and recognition. And maybe that ties to one of the other questions that we just had in the, in the chat. And it's related to um, you know, the environment that we typically find ourselves in in, in mine sites, you know, whether it's the mine site itself, whether it's the, you know, the processing buildings, in general, they're quite sterile environments or the camps, they're quite sterile environments. So um, Anthony's asking, is there something that we can do um, as an organization to make those in work environments more welcoming from a cultural perspective? Um, so maybe Erin, uh, I'll start with your thoughts and then we'll have to, uh, have to, try to add on. That's an interesting question. Um, so what I've seen uh, as some examples are when you're looking at building, say like a camping environment or an office environment. One, uh, could you actually, if it's a temporary um, camp, if it's a temporary office, could you actually build those on reserve? That could be something that would completely change the environment. Could you build it in uh, an indigenous community and that would create economic development opportunities, tax benefits, all of those kinds of things. It also just kind of changes exactly the space that you're in or the land that you're on. Um, I think a number of other things that I've seen are, you know, the design. So instead of, you know, a, a square box, uh, can there be spaces that are more dynamic or that bring in, you know, uh, round shapes, uh, natural materials, uh, and, and all the things down to signage. Can signage be in multiple languages, including the local indigenous language? Uh, artwork, um, even the color of the paint on the walls maybe being a little less sterile. So this is work that has to be done obviously in conjunction with the people designing the space and with health and safety to make sure that you can uh, do this in a safe way because there are really good reasons that maybe some of those environments are quite blank or quite sterile. So how do you work within those confines as well? But I've definitely seen some, some great ways that you can get creative in building out um, more inclusive spaces. Fred, I've always been inspired by your creativity. What, uh, what, what other things can you build on what Erin shared with us? Um, I think, I, again, this is a, a great opportunity. I think that, um, that people who work um, in industrial mine sites should know where they're at. So I think it should be built into the um, orientation that um, where you are and a bit, you know, a, a bit of the, uh, the nation. You know, and that should come probably come from the nation. You know what they're what's important to them, and you know, um, you can start from there. So people should know where they're at. I really think there should be images around the um, around the property. At at Stina, we uh, we just act and just happened to have a couple of people who really like to take pictures, and they started taking pictures of the local wildlife. And we worked with the Teltan Central Government to get the Teltan names of of the of the animals and we have those posted around so people can see um uh, images of, of, of local animals and, and what they're named in Teltan. we're working on a land a land declaration so we're gonna you know get a, an image of that's that's um that that you people can identify with the project and do a land declaration and uh, we are hoping to unveil that on Teltan day um, so when people come to the site, the first thing they see is the land declaration. Um, we would love to, um, I, I've been trying, I have a photographer friend who's Telton and really trying to get him to create do some images that we can post around the, uh, the mine site that, that identify, that Telton's identify with, um, um, landmarks and, and stuff like that. Um, and I would love to see pictures of our leaders with short bios so so people can come and see those as well. I think there's lot, lots of opportunity and art. Um, you know, every every mining company has a head office somewhere that has art on the walls. <laughs> you know, put put art, art <laughs> on, on the walls, right? And and support our artists. Um, so yeah, again, I think there's tremendous opportunity there to change the way we do those things and, and make them more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I, you just um, sparked something in my brain too. One of the things we just recently did um, at Tech was to put a call out for artist submissions from uh, the local communities that we work with and say, you know, we're doing this um, artwork uh, for National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. We'd love for people to send in submissions. And we're building up an artist, uh, basically like repertoire or like list of artists that we can call on for, like you said, there's all these different opportunities that come up all the time for different 
reports, for in-office artwork, for gifts, all of these kinds of things. So, you know, you can even find ways to involve community or even employees in submitting things for artwork. And one other thing that came to mind too was um, at one of our mind sites uh, were actually, uh, the group there is, is creating a space for indigenous employees. And it's uh, like a safe space where people can come if they just wanna have a chat, if they need a break, if they need someone to talk to. Um, and so building that space and it's in the community indigenous relations team office um, is another way that you can really build sort of those spaces and structures into maybe a pre-existing environment. I'm gonna have to pick your brain about the, uh, that list of artists um, as you can see, I like to keep my space pretty well decorated from an art perspective, even when I am in the office, because I do think, as you guys have said, you know, making sure that you're aware of the land and where you're at is very, very important. But I recall when we were talking earlier, you know, we talked a little bit about how it's so, so important for a mining company um, to be part of the community, to, to come and, and be embraced locally. And we often talk about mining mindsets being sort of remote, but they're not remote to many local communities. They're very in close proximity. So I remember us talking a little bit and you were highlighting some of the benefits to the mining company of employing local members. Maybe you could build on that a little bit. Sure. <clears throat> um, I think that, um, you know, having, having been in, in the industry for a long time, I see there are certain positions that would be really well suited for a, a local person, like critical positions. Um, because if, you know, if you, I've, you know, when you, when you go out of environmental compliance or when something breaks down, that needs, I've seen mining companies fly people in from like all over, <laughs> all over Canada. But what if you train somebody that lives locally <laughs> to, to fill those roles, right? You end up with, with somebody who's close, who could get there quickly. Um, and I've found that like, I, again, um, the, the indigenous local community, when I was at SK Creek and we faced a skill shortage in 2007 and 2008, and a lot of people were leaving, but their local community stayed. They weren't interested in going and working somewhere else. We were working with our family and friends from our community. Um, and we just, you know, they, they didn't see a lot of value in flying across the country to a different operation, regardless of what they were offering. So really that is, of incredible value to a mining company, right? If you have a workforce that's wanting, that, that they're invested in um, staying close to home and their their communities. They, they're not, their investment isn't solely with you as the employer. So fill those critical positions with those people. So you um, you protect your your project and, and you benefit the local community. And, you know, it's just such a win-win. Um, do we need to have a bit more flexibility in how we look at those sort of traditional employee-employer relationships? Uh, Lewis has asked a question about, um, about some alternatives um, between that sort of more traditional setup. Um, yeah, I've seen that question. I was, I'm not, I, I would like to, like, speaking of what we were just talking about, I would like to look outside our traditional ways of, of assessing skills and hiring people. I think we could be a lot broader with that. Um, I, um, I created a, a, a skills assessment, skills inventory database. It was called OnTrack and had the ability to test an individual's essential skill level. So in the National Occupation Codes database, um, there are essential skill levels for occupations um, across Canada. So somebody could um, take a test to see if they had the essential skill level to perform the tasks that are required by different occupations. So um, you could see somebody may have never been an underground production worker or a millwright or anything like that, but you could see if they have the skill level to do that. And um, then you could invest in that because you have that local workforce who, who, um, who won't leave you in a skill shortage. So, Looking at skills differently, assessing skills differently, um, and investing in those local workforce is, um, I think, is a, is a win-win. Um, but with the um, traditional employee-employer relationship, I 
you know, I do think there's, there's room for, um, you know, even for me in my, um, in my, in my work history, in my interviews, I would often tell employers like their system of rewarding people is based on working for them for a long time. Like your vacation goes up for <laughs> the longer you're with them, your pay goes up, like all that kind of thing. And I remember telling people in my interview that you, you, I'm not going to stay with you. I'm going to stay in my territory. <laughs> you know, like when I'm, I'm invested here. So I need you to not look at it that way because I won't be with you long. I'll eventually leave because I don't want to go work with you somewhere else. So I think looking at, um, looking at that relationship and, um, seeing the value in the local workforce, they're invested in the territory. They're invested in their communities and their families. And that investment can serve you very, very well as an employer and that, and, and putting some value on that. Yeah. Erin, I know we talked previously about sort of transferable skills, you know, and, and you yourself trans, you have leveraged transferable skills to move between industries. Um, but do we need to look beyond sort of technical skills and look at sort of um, maybe some some community based skills or some leadership skills that aren't um, immediately evident or more to how we would traditionally evaluate skills? Oh, yeah, very much. The technical skills are important. A lot of the time they can be learned. And I think, you know, what we often hear from people is, you know, we want the right fit. We want the right person who's going to come into the organization and you know, just be able to uh, to work with others. And that's really how you thrive. So I think there needs to be a big focus on soft skills and really understanding those. But this this goes back to that, you know, that earlier question on interview processes and being culturally aware and understanding how are soft skills presented? How do I um, read what those are in a person? So it is up to, to people who are trying to assess this to get to know the community, get to know the culture, uh, get to know a bit about what some of those skills might be that community members have. And then you can start to figure out, you know, how could these apply here? I think a big one that we hear all the time and, and so many companies are focusing on inclusion and diversity and really focusing on their, their corporate culture. So people who have that intercultural competency, we hear the phrase, you know, being able to walk in two worlds. That is like an amazing skill that you can help uh, bring to an organization and translate between here's, you know, community, here's their priorities, here's what they're saying, here's the culture, and how do I translate that to an organizational environment? And how do I then help others understand so people can help with bridging that or with that translation, however you want to phrase it, and then being able to spread that internally across the organization. That's a huge soft skill um, that's really, really needed. So paying attention to those things and how do they translate into jobs? Um, <laughs> it's a tricky one. Um, and going out and recruiting for that is tricky, but you really do have to think about it and think about that when you're interviewing people or going out there and networking with people. Are there any tools or assessments you would recommend to do almost like a self-assessment of your ability to sort of be culturally aware or just uh, celebrate diversity and inclusion? Tools. You know, I think one of the things that we kind of lack, or at least I do these days, is just the, the space for self-reflection. There are a number of, you know, the, those classic kind of personality tests and things that you can do to get to know yourself. But honestly, I, I can't say enough about actually having alone time to critically evaluate what are your priorities? Where do I feel like I thrive? Or where do I feel like I'm in flow? And having the space to do that. And I think it's important for managers to recognize that every employee needs that space. And, you know, how do we give that to them? And so when we're thinking about things like, I don't know, um, team retreats. <laughs> it's really good and you always want people to come together as a team, but how do we maybe make space for individual self-reflection and understanding what are the skills that I know that I have, what are the skills that I want to develop, and how do I translate those back to the team and maybe talk about how to gain those from others that I know. 
Um, so that's an interesting piece that could be built in as more of like a management or organizational tools to give that space and encourage that reflection. How about yourself, Freda? Are there any sort of key tools or resources that you refer to um, on a regular basis that you might to share with the group here? Um, I think that there's a lot of information online about nations have websites um, uh, and, and you can, if you can do some um, desktop research and you can find out a lot about a nation and what's important to them. Um, and for, I think, you know, like the world's changing, the industry's changing, coming to the table with, um, with, with an open mind and, and listening. I think is really important. Um, it's, you know, we all come to, to every table with our own perception and our, of our own lens on what, of what things, um, you know, what things, what, what, the, what the world looks like. But um, we've spent, I, you know, the mining industry has spent so long coming and presenting, this is, you know, and talking at people, but coming and listening. Um, and each community and each nation is very different. So um, yeah, come to the table with, an, do some research and come to the table with an open mind and listen. Thanks. And yeah, I think highlighting that um, many First Nations have websites that people should take the time to visit and, and that they are really good resources, um, are, I think is a, is a really good um, resource to highlight. Erin, uh, I see you put in the chat at insights as a potential tool and sort of funny personal antidote about insights. I had a leader who had me do the insights profile and, and literally one of the lines in mine was, um, Miriam has limited respect for authority and will only <laughs> follow rules if she understands them. Um, and so I think, it's, it, I mean, that was a really interesting self-reflection opportunity for myself. And just, again, the importance of comprehension and understanding the why behind something. And Fred, I think, you know, to your point about making sure you take the time to understand the why and the motivations and the context that people are coming to roles or opportunities with, it's really important as well. Okay. Yeah. So Aaron, I know one of the things we've talked about in the is in, in the past is the importance of being a human being, and like that. I think one of the lines I remember you saying is, "Um, a human is more inspiring than a pamphlet." So I'm, I'm assuming we've got some great leaders in the mining industry here on the call with us today. If you were um, a leader in the mining industry, how can you come across more as a human for to help with recruitment and retention than as a pamphlet? What are some tips? Yeah. Well, you know, one, it's, I think you have to learn to be a bit vulnerable. And when we're in leadership positions, when we've got our professional persona on, right, like that is kind of a persona. And so practicing being able to break that down, being vulnerable, and going back to what Frida said about just listening, as opposed to being there to present something, um, that's probably like the first step. So go and listen and like actively listen and respond and don't think, how do I, you know, uh, what am I gonna say next? What am I, you know, what am I here to say? What are my key messages? You should have those on hand a hundred percent, but like be there to be authentic and connect with that person and, you know, put away any sort of agenda, at least for some period of time and just connect with the person and have a real conversation. Like I said earlier, you can talk about, you know, what are your interests? What are your hobbies? What do you do on the weekend? What are you doing tonight? What did you make for dinner last night? You know, all of those kinds of things. And all of a sudden you're having a real conversation as opposed to you feel like you might be in an interview already. <laughs> um, so yeah, that vulnerability, being humble, just remembering that, you know, you're talking to another human being and maybe you can connect with this person on a completely different level than what you expected. And that's going to be a really valuable interaction regardless. Right, I recall you speaking about the importance of, of actually starting um, at, the, at the school level. So really just being a presence in, in schools for Indigenous communities. Is there, are there any um, examples that you want to highlight of that? Um, yeah, as, as the Community Relations um, Director for SCINA, we really try and get out into the community. We have, like, we have two community events a year that are just simply opportunities for people, SCINA, you know, whoever, 
from site or management or whoever to come to the community and meet informally. Um, no presentation, just have a burger <laughs> um, and, and talk, right? And I think those, and the communities themselves, they have, you, you know, all most communities will have events like social events that they, that they, they schedule, you know, to help, that we have Telcan Day on October 18th, you know, Indigenous Day. Indigenous communities will celebrate Indigenous Day. Understand what the communities are doing themselves and see if you can go, you know, um, and participate. And, you know, as Aaron said, listen, um, and, and be authentic and vulnerable and be willing to look at things differently and take off your lens and, and just, you know, try and understand. Um, and yeah, the communities themselves will have those opportunities and you can create them yourself as well. You know, we try and do that in the in the um in the fall and in the winter have have an event for people to come out to and um and enjoy and celebrate as a community thanks um there's been a few questions come to the chats just about specific tools or specific roadmaps that that maybe organizations can follow um freda you mentioned the skills assessment tool that that you had created um could you is that is that available to people or is that uh, where, where can people find that um, there's TALS, Test of Workplace Essential Skills. They have a website. You can go and um, take a look. And there is the Essential Skills Group. They create, they work with industry and can create um, skills inventory databases using essential skills. Um, the the um, ITA, what used to be the ITA, they've changed their name to Skills Canada or something now. They, they use that tool as well. They have an um, assessment tool on their website that anybody can use, actually. You don't even, you know. Um, and we use, we, and they, their website has the ability for employers to create a profile and have their employees do essential skill tests as well. I really think, um, like looking at skills differently is is in, is an incredible opportunity to be able to see the the indigenous workforce in a different light. So um, traditional practices such as hunting, um, guiding, trapping those are those those are occupations, and they're in the National Occupation Codes database, and they they require a high level of essential skills. Land based activities require a high level of essential skills. So the indigenous workforce who who is living remotely, even just living remotely creates a high level of essential skills because you don't have the resources people do in urban centers to fix your car, or fix your scooter, <laughs> you know, or fix your plumbing <laughs> if it goes wrong. You have to figure those things out on your own, which develops essential skills. So your, your local workforce um, may have a very high level of essential skills and your and employers are unaware of it. And, Really, you could, if you have a skilled workforce that won't leave you in a skills shortage, like how valuable is that? Amazing. Well, thank thank you so much, both. For, um, I'm I'm shocked at how quickly the time has gone, but maybe I'll just uh, ask you know each of you um, to share if there's any you know one or two last thoughts you would want to leave uh, the group here here today with. So, Erin, maybe I'll start with you and then hand it off to Freda. Sure, just really briefly, I'm glad Marianne you raised the phrase ecosystem. And if I can encourage everyone to just use an ecosystems approach to their thinking about the indigenous workforce, uh, that's gonna be super valuable. So think beyond just recruitment and retention and those kind of immediate pieces and think about the pathways, think about the boots on the ground mentality that we've talked about today. Think about being in community and spreading the word. And also what does really good offboarding look like? What does really good transition look like? Uh, so thinking about all of those things as a big continuum and spectrum. And people might come into your organization and stay for a while and leave, but they also might come back and they might have gained other skills elsewhere that they can bring back to you. So make sure that you're always keeping in touch with these networks and, and maintaining that relationship that you've invested in. Um, that's really, really important because again, I think we've talked about this many times today, these are real humans, right? They're people that we have relationships with. So make sure that we keep that front of mind as well. Thank you. Freda, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, echo what Aaron said, get to know the community. Um, and for like, I believe it's a two-way relationship. The community has a lot to offer. And um, as far as a, a skilled workforce and a, like a workforce that 
is invested in the local area and their family and the community and not necessarily which just you which will, will serve your industry and serve your like as an employer will serve you very well so understand the community understand how you can su support and help the community and understand how the community can help you thank you so much well thank you both Aaron and Freda for your time today it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and I also want to thank CM Dyack for setting up this platform and allowing us to share this conversation with the water CIM community so thank you everybody who was able to join us today um, we will be record the webinar has been recorded and will be shared on the on the website and um, we'll also try to follow up with the list of some of the resources that both Freda and Aaron shared in an email thank you so much Thank you. Thank you.